Welcome to today's webinar, Visual Literacy, How Learning to See Benefits Occupational Safety. During today's presentation, attendees will be in a listen-only mode. If the program you would like to submit a question, please use the chat pod located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, type your question into the box at the bottom, and click on the Send Message button. If you have technical difficulties, you may contact the help desk at 877-297. 2901. Now I'll turn it over to Joy in a way. Please go ahead. Thanks, Wendy. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar on visual literacy. If you're familiar with the Campbell Institute webinars that we hold periodically, uh, you'll be familiar with the great content that we bring to you. This time we have a really interesting webinar about a new research project that the Campbell Institute is embarking upon um, with uh, the partnership of Owens Corning and the Toledo Museum of Art. It's on visual literacy and how uh, honing these visual skills can improve our safety and our hazard recognition skills. We have a new white paper that was just released last year. You can um, download it from our website. I'll give you the URL for that uh, at the end of the presentation. And today we have Tom Daniel from Owens Corning to talk to us about how Owens Corning partnered with the Toledo Museum of Art um, to implement uh, this new training for visual literacy and, and how that training um, has improved the hazard recognition skills among the workforce. Let me introduce Tom. Tom Daniel is an experienced safety professional with over 27 years experience in a number of different industries including petrochemical, pharmaceutical, construction, and currently in manufacturing. He joined Owens Corning in 2004 and has held several EHS positions within the company. Currently, he's the global EHS leader working in the world headquarters office in Toledo, Ohio. He is responsible for the development and implementation of standardized corporate safety programs. He has successfully implemented many programs, including an internal hazard recognition and control certification program. Welcome, Tom, and take it away. All right, thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're here today to talk about visual literacy and how it can improve safety and how we actually utilize the concepts in the course um, within Owens Corning to improve our safety processes. So I thought it would be uh, useful here maybe to, to step back for a minute and talk about what visual literacy actually is. And uh, it's really the ability to read, comprehend, and write using visual language. I mean, we're taught numbers and letters in school, but the basic elements of visual language um, were not really taught. So in 2016, we became aware of a course at the Toledo Museum of Art, which is actually right down the street from our headquarters building, uh, was teaching titled Visual Literacy, Teaching People to See. Um, and it was really based upon the art museum doing an internal survey and finding that the average person was spending about 10 seconds or so in front of a piece of art. So they concluded that, that uh, people weren't actually seeing or appreciating what it is they were looking at. So they set out to uh, create a, a course that would really teach people how to see and maybe see at a deeper level um, the, the art that they were uh, coming to the art museum to, to take a look at. And the course defines the basic elements of visual literacy and uses a number of exercises designed to improve your ability to communicate visually. They, and they have a YouTube video that you, that you actually have access to, uh, which I wanted to show today, which summarizes their one-day course that they teach at the Art Museum. All right, Wendy, uh, we're ready for the video now. So what is visual literacy? Well, art museums can teach a lot about it because art is a language. It's a form of communication. So to be visually literate, you've got to know the alphabet and the vocabulary and the grammar of seeing. Little children, we're told, from the first day they have on the planet up to the age of five, take in more information than at any other time in their lives. They're truly sentient beings taking in information with all their human senses all the time. Everything we see is an image. There really isn't a difference between text and image, because a text is an image, and an image is a text. So we have to 
learn how to read images through the process of vision. Now, we know that today we live in a media-saturated age, an image-saturated age, where we're taking in images all the time, and we need to broaden what it means to be literate, to read images rather than text as image. So it's more than reading and writing. It's reading the visual world. 21st century students' studies tell us young people today are consuming images at an extraordinary rate. In the last four years, we're told, young people are actually looking at images throughout the day one hour and 17 minutes more than they used to. So that's actually seven hours and 38 minutes every day. Extraordinary, but how many young children have actually been taught how to read images? How many teachers have done a course in not just the process of vision, but how to read images, whether at college or university? The use of every type of media has increased over the last decade, except reading. We need to learn how to read and to read images. It's considerably a question that is socioeconomic. If you're a child from a lower income family, you've been read to on average about 100 hours by the age of five. But if you're from an upper income or middle income family, you've been read to over a thousand hours by the age of five. So you're 10 times more advantaged going to school. Visual literacy is essential because we need to be able to construct meaning to make sense of everything that we see. What does this mean? Why did the Toledo Museum of Art put this strange red thing in front of this building, this very formal classic building with all its straight lines? And this curvaceous underbody of this spiky, angular creature? Well, we wanted to have fun. We wanted to make sure that young people would feel it's fun to go into the museum. It's not austere. It's a welcoming place. Visual literacy has been around for a long time, but it's difficult because there are so many different definitions of it. And we have to make it understandable so it becomes part of the curriculum. The International Visual Literacy Association started in the late 1960s. They have a journal and they have an annual conference. And the first real primer on visual literacy was published in 1973, and there have been many books since. So what does this mean? Looking at this image, you see these young people all dressed in red and white striped outfits. Some of you will know Where's Waldo or Where's Wally, a game where you search for the Waldo or Wally that's different from all the others. So what does this mean? Well, if you're a focal point learner, if you're somebody who's been trained on ABC123 with focal point perspective, you'll probably train your eye to look all around this image. You'll move your eyes all around until you find the Wally or the Waldo that's different. But if you're somebody who's actually challenged with reading and writing, or you grow up in a culture that doesn't emphasize textual learning, you'll probably scan or scope this image. That's how most people were until 500 years ago when we had the printed book revolution. A visually literate person is simply put, able to read and write visual language. Visual literacy is a process of sending and receiving images. They make messages. We can construct meaning from them. And then we can combine all the different literacies that we have to read our multimedia world. Visual literacy is the ability to construct meaning from images. So it's not actually a skill. It uses skills as a toolbox. It's a form of critical thinking that enhances your intellectual capacity. It helps you to interpret the content and the meaning of images, to examine their social impact, to think about them from the point of view of, well, what was intended? What was their purpose? Who owns them? Who are they being sent to? And helping you to visualize the process of visualization and human imagination. Visual literacy helps you to communicate visually, to read and write images, to read and understand them, to make sense of them, to become aware of judgments about them, whether they're accurate, are they valid, what are they worth, what value do they have? So what does this mean? People from Toledo, Ohio will know this as the peristyle theater of the Toledo Museum of Art, but it's certainly grand. It's made to impress. It's powerful. It's got lots of seats. It's very grand. It's a 
place that inspires awe and imagination in every young person that sees it. Because we know to read it is to feel special and to feel inspired. Today, our education system emphasizes textual literacy. Those ABCs, one, two, threes, the digits and letters. And of course, rightly so also, digital communication, the tools of our digital revolution. But we neglect sensory literacy, those human senses, as core curriculum. So, textual literacy and computer literacy are the core of the STEM system, as we call it. Some people want to put the A in STEM, the arts in STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. But it's much more than that. We need to put the entire human senses into textual and computer literacy. And the dominant sense, the prominent sense, is the visual sense. Visual literacy is the key sensory literacy. We have to teach it because since we became erect human beings standing up, we moved away from when we were closer to primates nearer to the ground and used taste and smell. And now we dominantly use hearing, but mainly we use our sight. And we need to train ourselves how to see. There have been only three communications revolutions of grand scale in human history. So to be living one is indeed confusing. It's a very exciting time to be alive, but we're trying to absorb a revolution. The first communications revolution was 5,000 years ago in the Sumerian Empire, when they invented cuneiform writing. And it took a whole 4,500 years to get to the next great revolution, the printed book revolution, the Gutenberg revolution, as it's called, of the 15th century in Europe. And so we learned our ABCs and our 123s, and we moved forward only 500 years this time to the third great revolution, which is the digital revolution of our time. All students who graduated in 2013 have had the internet since the day they were born. It went live on Christmas Day in 1991. So we need to continue to teach the human senses, to understand that little child before the age of five is the adult that they will become. And the human senses being so important, we need to understand vision. That up to 90% of all the information we take in from the world, we take in with our eyes. It becomes that great memory bank of images that informs the way that we see the world. Now, the optic nerve has a million nerve fibers. It has 30% of the entire brain cortex, and that's so much more than any other human sense. But we understand so much more about it now because of brain science and all that cognitive neuroscience has taught us through the digital revolution. The key message is that we have to be more visually literate and we need to train people how to see. To do that, first of all, you need to take your time. You need to pay attention. Museums use lots of techniques to train people how to see. One is a technique like this, learning to look. When we look at something, we often make assumptions about it. We've already decided what it is because we've seen it before. But if we really look at it, we take our time and we start to see it. When we can really see it, we can begin to describe it very accurately. And after describing it, we can ask analytical questions about it, like, what's it made of? And when we've gone through this four-stage process, we then begin to construct meaning. We begin to make sense of what we see. We begin to become visually literate. Look at this image. It's an image of a painting by Thomas Cole in the Toledo Museum of Art collection called The Architect's Dream. You can pause here if you like. Now, imagine what you've seen and place it on this black background. Can you fill in the big picture and all the details? Did you go to the details first and then to the big picture? Pause and try and paint the picture for yourself. Here it is again. What did you see? Now, in terms of learning the grammar of how to look, a good approach is to study the visual elements of art. You can use these to look at any image and to think about it in terms of its line, those continuous marks with height and width that have no depth or its shape, the enclosed area that defines the other elements in a composition, such as line, or color, which is the full light spectrum, and the black and white, all the possible combinations that you can make in terms of hue, which is the name that we give to the colors, or the intensity, which is the purity we give to them, 
are the value of them, which is the degree of lightness or darkness that they have. And then we can think about space, those areas around or within objects and the arrangement of them on the surface. Or texture, the tactile quality of an object. Then you can apply these five elements back to the Thomas Cole image. Now you're seeing it differently. You can see it through these five different possibilities. And some more, form, the time that you see, values, different kinds of values. And then you can think about it in terms of the principles of art, emphasis and balance and harmony and variety and movement and proportion and rhythm and unity. Let's look at the image again. The emphasis, the point or points of focus that you see in the composition, are the balance, the sense of visual equilibrium. What about harmony, the balanced use of similar elements, or variety, the use of different or often contrasting elements that create visual interest? Or movement, the way the shapes and the lines and the colors and the forms all direct your eye around the composition, suggesting motion? Or proportion, the relative scale of objects and shapes in an image? Or rhythm, the path your eye follows, a regular or repeating arrangement of shapes or colors or whatever, and its sense of unity, its overall coherence. When you learn these elements and principles, you walk back out into the world. If you walk outside the Toledo Museum of Art, you go next door and see Frank Gehry's very remarkable Center for the Visual Arts, and you start to see it, to see it with the visuals of its lines and its shape and its color, space, its texture, and all those principal elements, whether it's harmonious or proportional, whether it's a unified composition. Or you go back into the Toledo Museum of Art and you see Jack Louis David's The Oath of the Horatii, and you read these arched areas in the background as a space that encompasses these figures, these dramatic gestures, the triangles, the various volumes. You start to read it much more easily. Now, there's lots of ways we can do this. Some of you may love birding, looking at the differences and the similarities between birds. Some of you may collect postage stamps, play golf, play baseball. Do lots of things that cause you to look very, very carefully. Study the difference between roses, the difference between colors, and you learn how to spot the difference. Lots of publications these days have crosswords and Sudoku, but not many have spot the difference. And it's a great game. Look at this image. The one on the right is different from the one on the left. But you're already looking at it in terms of the elements and principles. Now pause it and look very carefully for the differences. Did you spot them all? It's difficult, but the more we train our eyes to see, the easier it becomes. Some people walking into the Toledo Museum of Art see the cloister in the museum and maybe don't notice that those arches, those round shapes in the background, are different from the pointed ones in the foreground. This cloister with its sides all came from different places. Those of you who would know art history would know that the round-shaped arches are earlier, from the Romanesque period, and the near ones are Gothic, later. There are lots of different approaches we can have to being visually literate. In art museums, we can study art history. We can analyze works of art over time. We can also use the formal approaches that we've talked about in terms of the elements of art and the principles of design. But we can also study iconology, symbols and what they mean, or ideology, when images give you different aspects of beliefs, values, or of ideas. Or semiotics, one of the great subjects of the 20th century for us, the differences between signs and a signifier and what's signified or hermeneutics, which is the literal and intended meaning. And all of this will help us to become more visually literate, to become more sensorially aware. Looking at this image, some of you will see quickly the object in the center, and some of you will see the white-shaped faces looking at each other. And then you'll say to each other, I see what you mean. All right, thank you, Wendy. Let's see here. 
All right, so as you saw in the video, the Art Museum developed what they called a basic vocabulary for visual literacy, for seeing art. It started by having people study specific aspects, namely colors, lines, shapes, spaces, and, and textures. And in the course that they teach, they assign each person in the class one of the characteristics to look for and describe what that specific characteristic means or represents in the picture. So if you take this same concept to a manufacturing environment, and you, you see the picture we have up there of a generic manufacturing environment, um, you could have the class spend about 10 minutes looking at different characteristics. Uh, for example, the color yellow, what does that represent in the picture? And we would say, well, typically that represents caution and is used in this environment to signify railings around the stairs and the platform and the ladders, including the safety cage. Um, what about the color red? You know, it can be seen in the ceiling, and you typically conclude that based on previous experience, that these are probably fire lines. So you can have a pretty robust conversation if you start looking at all of the different characteristics, the lines, the shapes, and the spaces, and the textures um, in the manufacturing environment. So how do you apply these concepts to safety? Where could having employees see things that they're not seeing today or seeing things at a deeper level help us improve safety? We found value, at Owens Corning, we found value at, in starting with our hazard recognition program and our incident investigation process. We have an internal certification program in hazard recognition where employees learn specific techniques to improve their ability to see hazards and develop appropriate corrective actions to either eliminate or effectively control those hazards. They can get certified as specialists specialist in the program by demonstrating their ability to take the techniques and actually utilize them in their, in their work environment. We also found value in incorporating the techniques from uh, visual literacy into our uh, incident investigation process. And when we began looking at incorporating it into our hazard recognition process, we didn't see value in having employees just staring at their plant looking for lines and shapes. So what we decided to do was actually create our own vocabulary for hazard recognition. Um, if you think about lines and shapes and spaces, that's, that's a good technique for art and, uh, and works well for that environment. We didn't see it working really well from a manufacturing perspective to look for hazards. So what we set out to do is actually define our own vocabulary. And following the same pattern as the art museum, we define the top five interactions that lead to injury based on our internal experience. And the plan is to uh, expand this vocabulary over time. We have employees focus on specific hazards associated with these interactions, and we also take into account how those interactions change as conditions in the plants change. So I'll go into the, uh, to the exact interactions that we're looking for here. Uh, we, based upon our experience, we tend to have injuries fall into, uh, many of our injuries fall into these five categories. Um, and the interactions are where employees are walking or standing. Uh, many people look at that as walking, working surfaces. Uh, when employees are expected to use tools. When employees are expected to handle product or material. When employees interact with the equipment, including maintenance and when employees are working in close proximity to forklifts. We identified some of the common potential hazards associated with all five of these areas, and that's what we decided to focus on. So for example, when we're looking at walking working surfaces, we wanted employees to really hone in on slip hazards, tripping hazards, and fall hazards. And you can see some specific ones up there on the screen. On tool use, we wanted them to look at, you know, how are the tools being used? What kind of tools are they? What, what are the conditions? Um, is there evidence of people misusing the tool, not using for uh, the way it was intended or using the wrong tool? Uh, when we talk about material handling or product handling, we're looking at, you know, where are employees lifting heavy loads or bending or twisting, uh, multiple or frequent lifting, sharp edges or overhead lifting? All of those tend to lead or have the potential to lead to, uh, to injuries in our manufacturing environment. 
interacting with equipment, so the potential hazards there are unguarded or insufficiently guarded moving equipment, sharp edges, awkward body positions, uh, particularly around uh, when maintenance is being done, and then just hand positions in general. And what we also found, it's not just where people put their dominant hand. So if you're right-handed, you, you tend to work, do most of the work with your right hand. But you also have to be aware where you put your left hand. A lot of times uh, you're doing that uh, subconsciously. You're not even paying attention to where, you know, where you're putting your other hand. So we found that to be something that we wanted them to look for also. And then finally, with uh, close proximity to forklifts, we're looking for pedestrian walkways, forklift traffic patterns, intersections and blind corners. Uh, you can read the list through the list there. Uh, what we're talking about with evidence of noncompliance, uh, you know, footprints or tire tracks where there shouldn't be footprints or tire tracks, uh, tire marks on posts or guardrails, or scratches or dents on the forklift itself. Uh, and, and we also consider employee workstations and travel paths. Are they sufficiently away from the forklift traffic, or are people uh, adequately protected from that traffic? Now, we've got a lot of things that we just went through there, and we don't expect people to memorize those lists, so we actually created a uh, kind of a quick reference guide of what we're, what we're looking for, and employees can take this with them when they're actually doing their walkthroughs. Um, and then what we, what we end up doing is having them just focus on one, like you see uh, tool use circled there. So employees are given one of the five items to focus on during their inspections. And our certification process has them focus on one topic for a whole month before they switch to a different topic. And uh, the intent of this is to build their awareness and competency around the hazards that most often lead to, to uh, injuries in our business. Then I wanted to throw this in there. This is one of our slides, and, uh, and there's not a picture in there on purpose. Because when we're preparing to teach one of our hazard recognition courses in our plants, we ask the instructor to insert a picture from that specific plant into the slide deck and then assign a specific interaction to each person in the class. Uh, so somebody's looking for the walking working surfaces, another person's looking for tool use, and, and write down the list of the five different interactions. And you give the class 10 to 15 minutes to study the picture, looking for their assigned interactions and the potential hazards they would anticipate with those interactions. Then after about 10 or 15 minutes, we actually take the class out into the plant to the actual area that the picture was taken in and do a field exercise the same way to see if they actually missed anything uh, when they were talking through the exercise in the classroom. And then when we get back to the class, uh, we actually have a roundtable discussion about what interactions did they identify, what potential hazards did they see, did they see additional ones when they were out in the plant that they didn't think about when they were in the class, and then what recommendations do they have to either eliminate the hazard or at least reduce the risk of somebody being injured by that hazard. Um, and then as part of our course, we actually have employees uh, risk rank their recommendations and then uh, walk them through how to, to uh, get them completed at the local plant. And what we're finding in the program is by having employees focus on one specific type of hazard, it becomes easier and easier for them to see it. And over time, sometimes it becomes hard to not see those hazards. And the art museum actually has a, an interesting uh, couple of slides here that illustrates how uh, sometimes the hazard pops right out at you, uh, uh, once you once you've identified it. For example, do you see the hazard in the picture? It's a black and white picture. It appears to be of a jungle. And I'll leave it up there for just a few seconds to see if you see the, see the hazard in the picture. If you've seen this before, it's probably jumping out at you. And if you haven't seen the picture before, it may not be. Sometimes we can't see the hazards that's right in front of us until, I, until we get a different perspective. So what I'll do is I'll show the same picture but in color. Now do you see the panther down here in the uh, lower right-hand corner? It was actually there in the other picture but very difficult to see. But now that you've seen this picture in color, let's go back to the black and white one and see if the image 
jumps out at you. And it tends to uh, be a lot easier to see to the point where it's hard to not see it anymore, even when you're staring at or looking at the black and white picture. I thought that was an interesting exercise that the art museum does to, to kind of illustrate that point. And then we want to make sure that we consider all working conditions. We know that in a manufacturing environment, interactions can change when conditions change. So we have to ensure that we consider all the common working conditions. And I've got them listed up there. You know, normal operations, when everything's running the way we designed it to run, um, abnormal or upset conditions, when the machines are not running the, the, same, the way they were designed to run. Uh, you know, a lot of times people are in different positions and working with the equipment differently uh, during those situations. So you have to make sure that you uh, account for those. Uh, maintenance uh, brings a whole other set of potential hazards. And then when we have planned or, or unplanned shutdowns, uh, the, the potential hazards can change in those conditions also. So we want to make sure that we include all of the different working conditions that, that employees would, uh, might find themselves in. So that's how we incorporated uh, the concepts of visual literacy into our hazard recognition process. Now I want to talk about how uh, we incorporated it into our incident investigation process. Two specific exercises from visual uh, literacy training uh, were back-to-back -back drawing and the puzzle building. Uh, these ex exercises highlight the importance of effective communication and not drawing conclusions until you have the entire story. Here you see the back-to-back -back exercise uh, that the Art Museum did at the National Safety Council a couple of years ago to illustrate this point. Uh, the lady on the left is considered the drawer, and the, uh, the gentleman on the right is the describer. And the, the rules of the exercise is it lasts five minutes, so it's timed. The drawer, can't, the drawer can't ask questions and can't see the object being described. He's got it in his hand there. And the describer can't ask any questions and can't look at the drawing. So the describer is trying to describe the object that he has in his hand, and the lady on the left is trying to draw that object on a piece of paper. And then after the five minutes, you compare the drawing to the actual object and ask, how did the person describing the object impact how the drawer drew it? And did the, did the describer learn anything about their communication skills? And did the drawer start drawing right away, or did they wait until the describer gave them a fairly detailed description before they started drawing? And how did the five-minute time limit impact each person and how they, uh, how they did their respective roles? And what do you learn out of this exercise? One-way communication often leads to misunderstanding. How someone describes something may not be exactly how someone else hears it or pictures it in their mind's eye. Because what I found when, when I was going through that exercise, and I've actually been, uh, both, you know, uh, been in both roles in that exercise, is you know, as soon as somebody starts describing something for you, you start picturing uh, what that object might look like in your head. And a lot of that is drawn by previous experience. So what we find when we do that exercise, a lot of times the scale and, uh, uh, are different. And as the describer is describing something, depending on how they go about doing it, whether they start from the, you know, the bigger picture and move into the details or start with details and move out, really has a big impact on how the drawer sees it in their mind's eye and how they are actually able to draw it on a piece of paper. It's really an interesting exercise. The other exercise is putting the puzzle together. This exercise starts by passing a piece of puzzle. So you see two pieces up there. Um, pass out a piece of puzzle to each table and have the table start drawing conclusions based upon their piece of the puzzle. So you'd have this one piece at a table of four or five people and you start you know, trying to draw conclusions about what what you think the bigger object represents based upon just the one piece that you have. So depending on what piece of the puzzle you have, you may be closer to, uh, to what the overall object is, but a lot of pieces are not all that descriptive, and uh, it's very difficult to draw conclusions based upon one or two pieces. 
But what we end up doing is having tables start combining their pieces and drawing conclusions. So you might have two or three tables who now have three or four pieces of the puzzle. And it starts getting, the picture starts getting clearer and clearer as you start bringing it together. And you saw this painting actually on the Art Museum uh, YouTube video. So once you get to the end, you may find that the, that the puzzle itself is much different than what you thought when you only were seeing one or two pieces of it. And I thought this, um, this is a great illustration how ultimate conclusions can change when all the puzzles of the uh, pieces of the puzzle are obtained and you have all the facts. This particular piece is the Oath of the uh, Her Herite. And if you Google it, uh, you can actually find out more about it. Um, it's actually uh, a depiction of a, uh, of a uh, conflict that was going on back in Roman times. And uh, the, the warriors on the left were getting a blessing from their father before they went out to war. And uh, the ladies behind them were obviously sad about the, uh, about the fact that the, the three uh, young men there might, might be killed in, in a war. So I thought this exercise actually did a really good, really nice job um, illustrating how you can jump to conclusions uh, before you actually have all of the facts. So the key learning, at the start of the investigation, you only have a few pieces of the puzzle. The more you learn, the picture starts to form. But you must wait to gather all of the information before you can get to the complete picture and draw your conclusions. So that's how we used some of the concepts from visual literacy. And they actually have more. And we intend to use more of the concepts in some other areas of our safety uh, processes here at Owens Corning, but that's two examples of how we utilized what we learned in the visual literacy class at the Toledo Art Museum and incorporated them into our processes and I think made them better. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joy for any questions. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, at this point, we are ready to take uh, any questions that you might have, so feel free to Type those into the into the chat box so we can see it. Um, and as we as we wait for some questions uh, to come in here, um, I'll just um, I'll maybe some things that I'll ask uh, Tom here. So you gave us some very good examples of how. Um, of these exercises, and then um, how you uh, implemented it within Owens Corning. Do you have ideas for what the next steps are going to be? Yeah, I think uh, our next step probably would be to expand out the vocabulary, where we talked about the five interactions. You know, obviously we have more um, more areas that we could. Uh, uh, improve people's ability to, to recognize hazards more than just the five that we listed there. So I think the plan going forward would be to expand that vocabulary out. We're also looking at you know the, the possibility of using some other you know technologies uh, to teach this course um, as well. Okay, great. Um, we have some we have several questions coming in. Here is the question, have you used the concepts of visual literacy in areas outside of safety? We haven't used them at Owens Corning, but I know the Art Museum is looking for other opportunities um, to utilize the concepts. And, uh, we're, and we are looking at uh, whether it fits within our TPM process, uh, but I think the concepts can be utilized anywhere that you're looking for people to see something at a, you know, at a deeper level or see something at all that they're not currently seeing. So I, you know, I think the concepts could easily transition to other things other than safety, you know, whether it's quality or, or you know, the construction business. And you know, I think it's, it's kind of limitless um, the number of areas uh, that you can utilize these techniques where you're looking for people to see things you know, a lot better than they're able to see them today. A question about the the training um, t 
timeline. So how long are these trainings for visual literacy within Owens Corning? And there was also another um, question that had to do with training, and maybe I can tack that on as well. Um, is this uh, is this training um, given to all new hires? And uh, also a timing question: How long does that take on average? Well, we actually have two hazard recognition courses. The second one, and both of them are somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six hours, depending on how many field exercises you do. Um, and that's kind of left up to the instructor. Um, you know how many times you want to go out into the plant, and because uh, you can rotate around the the interactions. Meaning, when you come back to the room and, and do your roundtable, you could actually give, you know, switch up the interactions and have people look at different ones, and then go to a different part of the uh, part of the plant. And we have a couple of them built into our program. Uh, so it really depends upon how long those exercises take, you know, how far you go out in the plan, how much time you spend out in the plan, how many times you do it. But we, we see on average you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six hours for the course. And then the certification process can actually take months after the course uh, for people to demonstrate their ability to utilize the techniques in their work environment. If, you're, if the question is around the Toledo Art Museum visual literacy course where you learn the techniques, uh, Joy, you might have to help me with that because I sat in with you. I want to say that one is like right around five or six hours. Um, it's about it's it's a two day workshop and it's about uh, yeah I'd say like five to six hours per day. Okay. Yeah. That's oh, that's right. It was two days. You're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Here is a question about uh, the puzzle exercise, could you speak to the conclusions that the students drew from that puzzle exercise? Sure. If you go back through it, um, this might not be the greatest example because you guys saw the, the completed picture in the Art Museum YouTube video. But you know, as people start getting the pictures, depending on what piece uh, your table had uh, could really impact the conclusions that, they, that they're drawing on the picture itself. And we've used different pictures also. Uh, this one tends to, to kind of really set the stage that you're in the Roman area pretty quickly, uh, regardless which puzzle piece you have. But I know the Art Museum has used different pictures where it's really hard to tell what that, the bigger picture is going to, to uh, take shape based upon one or two pieces. This particular uh, drawing, uh, you know, it's, it's a little less difficult to do that, but depending on which puzzle you pick, it can be very difficult to draw a conclusion on what the final picture is going to look like. Great. All right, let me get another question up here. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, a question here. Uh, you indicated that you use two visual literacy techniques, but that there are many others. What are they, and are there uh, are there lists of these other techniques? Um, you know, I, I don't remember all of the different techniques at the art museum. We actually utilize three different ones. The the main one is the uh, building your uh, virtual vocabulary, and then the two that we used in our incident investigation process were the back to back drawing and the puzzle. Uh, putting the puzzle together. Um, it's been a while since I went through the art museum training. I would have to go back through their material to, to remember what the different exercises were. But um, if, you're, if you're interested in that, I would reach out to the art museum and ask them. I'm not aware of anything that's actually published out there that, that walks you through what the different exercises are. Uh, we did have a question here about you know, other recommendations for sources uh, for further study, and I don't. I know that Tom um, that the museum has a, a list of like um, sources that you could go to for further reference. But do you do you happen to know of any offhand? As far as other companies utilizing some of the techniques, uh, that could be one. Yeah, sure. I mean that's that's probably where I would go with that, and I don't have an up to date list. 
Uh, maybe if they contacted you, Joy, you would be able to, to make the connection with the art museum. Sure. I, I don't have a direct line um, into there. I'd have to look it up. But if somebody has a question around that, maybe if they could get back to you and you could put them in contact with the art museum, would that work? Yeah, that would work. And I know that uh, as far as just on the visual literacy concept itself, not necessarily how it's implemented for safety or how many companies are using it, the museum has uh, many resources, and I think you can find those on their website. Okay. So that's how we'll answer that question. Um, uh, uh, some Another question here. Um, what results or hazard ID improvements have you seen since implementing this program at Owens? Well, we're getting a lot more hazards identified and a lot, I don't, I don't want to say better hazards, you know, more uh, detailed hazards identified. And, and we're actually, we actually have created a bunch of advocates uh, for not only identifying the hazards, but in the course we teach them how to document them. The, the first course, our hazard uh, recognition and control uh, number one course, our first uh, version of this, was prior to our, us working with the art museum. So it does not include the visual literacy piece. And in that uh, course, uh, we teach people how to write effective JHAs and teach them some techniques uh, about identifying hazards. But in the second course that we developed in conjunction with the art museum, uh, we, we take them through the techniques that you just learned about in this webinar um, is, is basically the first half of the course. And then the second half of the course is, okay, the recommendations that you made, how do we go about making sure that those actually get completed at the plant level? You know, turn them into corrective actions. Uh, we teach the folks how to risk rank them. So we now have folks, you know, that work are a lot of, in a lot of cases our hourly folks that work on the line um, are helping us not only identify the hazards, but also risk rank them, build a case uh, to justify getting them corrected, and walking them through, in some cases, the capital delivery process if they require you know, capital expense to get them fixed, but also uh, walk them through how to correct hazards um, in the short term versus the long term. You know, the, the capital delivery being more the long term corrective action, but you know, how do we keep somebody from getting hurt by that hazard until the, the capital delivery uh, solution can be implemented? So you know, that is the second half of the course is really teaching people what to do with the recommendations once they're made. Kind of uh, following up to that question, um, what metrics has Owens developed to kind of measure success in this area of training? Um, and has Owens actually seen a reduction in incidents and injuries? Well, we're, we're actually working on that right now as part of our work with the Art Museum is to figure out the best way to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to basically just count up how many hazard IDs people are finding. So I don't know that we're finding that, the, you know, that that's a useful measure. That could be a measure. But I think your point is how effective is the training at really impacting uh, the types of hazards people are, are uh, uh, flagging or identifying. And that is a project that is, that is an active one right now. We don't have a solution for it as yet, but we are actively working on trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Great. We, we've partnered with our corporate training group to help us with that because that is one of their expertise that, that we don't have within EHS is really you know, putting a, a, a quantifier to how the training is impacting overall performance. Thanks for that answer. Uh, going back to one of the activities, uh, you had mentioned the back-to-back -back drawing. Uh, what is an example of a picture that a describer would have to explain um, to the drawer in that exercise? Well, at the, when we did our training at the art museum, um, what they would end up doing is taking the describers out into one of the display areas in the art museum, and we could pick a piece of art, basically anything we wanted to, and then we'd lead the drawer out to that area, don't let them see it, and then we do our back-to-back -back at that point, and I would have to describe whatever is the piece of art in front of me. And it could be a picture like you're seeing on the screen, 
or it could be a three-dimensional piece of art. Um, so that's how we did it at the art museum. In the picture that we showed in the presentation, that was actually done in a conference room as part of the training at the National Safety Council. Um, I believe it was two years ago, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And, so. and we, we had some of the, the uh, instructors from the Art Museum come to the National Safety Congress. And what they ended up doing was just picking small items from the dollar store. Um, I, I'm not sure what Glenn has in his hand there, but it, it may have been like a little plastic army guy. It, it really doesn't matter. It's just a small object uh, that might have some details to it that the drawer would have, you know, that the describer would have to describe to the drawer um, is really what you're looking for. I don't know that it's necessarily about the item itself, just something that's small in nature for, for this type of an environment. Uh, that would require the describer to spend a little bit of time describing in detail what it what it is he's he's looking at. Mm -hmm. I just want to take care of a couple of questions that are coming in regarding the availability of the presentation. So um, I know Tom that you cannot make these PowerPoint slides available uh, just because of. Um, uh, proprietary concerns uh, on the part of Owens Corning. However, we, we will have a recording of the entire webinar uh, available uh, shortly after uh, today uh, and definitely by early next week. So uh, you will be able to, to view the entire video recording at the Campbell Institute website, which will be thecampbellinstitute.org slash webinars. Okay, so we took care of that question. Also, the, the handouts, yes, that are uh, included as part of this webinar, th those are part of another webinar. Those are not part of our webinar. So um, uh, don't uh, worry if they don't match the presentation. We actually don't have any handouts uh, for this webinar. Um, okay, so another question here. Um, and I believe, Tom, both you and I know the answer to this question. So uh, we have several questions about the, the training that the museum offers. And I will say that NSC does not offer, uh, the National Safety Council does not offer this visual literacy training. This is all done through the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, and it is done on their site. Um, as far as I know, they do not have an online training program. Can you? Uh, corroborate that, <laughs> Tom? Yeah, I, I, I don't believe they have. I haven't seen anything online. Um, I know they have come out and, and done some remote training, kind of like you see it on the screen there at the uh, National Safety Council. Um, I know they have done some remote training uh, where they would come out to a site and, and train folks. I, I don't know the details on that um, and the, or the logistics of it. Again, I, I would uh, ask people if they're interested in something like that, that maybe they go through you, Joy, to get the contact at the Art Museum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I believe that uh, TMA is, uh, they, they are considering uh, developing an online training, but uh, once again, that's a, that's a question for, for the Art Museum folks themselves. Uh, we, a question about the, that really interesting panther photo that you had showed before. Uh, regarding that photo, would you suggest a staging an actual workspace with less obvious hazards and then asking um, workers or an audience to identify them? Um, you can. The reason why we ended up going with a picture of the actual work environment is because I think it allows people maybe to make the connection of what we're, what we're really asking them to do. Because if you, um, if you kind of think back through the presentation, we put a generic, by the way, that wasn't a picture of one of our plants. It was a generic manufacturing environment, pretty sterile one, uh, that the art museum used when, when they actually trained us. Um, and we looked for lines and shapes in that picture. And I think that helps bridge the gap because you're utilizing the techniques with the lines and the shapes and the spaces, and you're looking at a manufacturing environment and then the next step would be then, okay, let's look at your manufacturing environment and look for these different, um, you know, we're, we're focused on interactions rather than lines and shapes. So I think it helps people if you t walk them through the, the thought process of going from looking at a piece of art, using these, 
uh, techniques. Let's look at a manufacturing environment using these techniques. Now let's look at your manufacturing environment and use a little bit different techniques, but are fairly, you know, uh, easily relatable is what we're finding. I have a couple of questions about the training. I'm going to see if I can combine a couple of questions here. So, um, who is the audience for the training? Is it line supervision, um, our hourly workforce, um, or all? Um, and how do you get operations management to agree to giving uh, people time that they need for the training? Well, uh, to answer the first question, it's any combination of those. Uh, we have over 800 people that are certified in our first version of the class, and, the, and those folks are now starting to go through the second version, which is, uh, like I said earlier, includes visual literacy. Uh, but it really is a, a, a commitment at the local level at the plants to not only conduct the training, but in a lot of cases allow people the time it takes to then go back and, and actually complete the certification. So, I mean, we have trained thousands of people, and I would, I would venture to say most of the company has received some level of hazard recognition training, um, and, mo and many of them have went through the four to six hour class. And like I said, about 800 or so have went on and actually got certified in the, in, the, uh, in the program. But it really is a commitment at the local level to see a value in having people do that. So it is a combination of our salary folks and our hourly folks, so the, the leaders at the plant as well as you know, the hourly workers on the, on the plant floor, um, you know, we, get, we ask for and get a nice cross-section of both. And kind of a follow-up to that, do you have any kind of um, anecdotal uh, evidence or just uh, qualitative evidence of um, how employees have responded to this education and training? Is this seen as a, as a value add and a, uh, a valued skill to them? Yeah, as a matter of fact, when people get certified, uh, the trainers, and by the way, we have certified trainers in this process. You actually have to be certified to, to give the training. Um, when, when somebody gets certified, they, they send a, a blast email out to a pretty big distribution list, and as part of that, we ask them to include what uh, the employee learned from the event or from the, from the experience of not only the training but going through the whole certification process. And it's really interesting seeing the quotes that come out of those emails. But I think the one that you know, hits home for me the, the most is when I hear people say, you know, it's really opened my eyes about uh, seeing hazards differently. And I'm not talking about just at work. I mean all the time. So they're really taking things home with them um, and seeing hazards in their lives more so than just at work. And I think that's probably the bigger impact and, you know, by the way, that makes it a little more difficult to, to put a, you know, uh, quantitative number on how impactful the training really is. Because we're only really able to measure, and, and we haven't figured that piece out quite yet, but I would envision us really being able to measure at work the difference in the training. But what would really be interesting is being able to measure, you know, in other parts of employees' lives, how, how has this changed them? Um, and we may be able to get, get to some of that in a survey format, but that really comes across all, very often in the quotes that we, that we hear after somebody gets certified. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we are quickly approaching the top of the hour, so I will, I will close this out here. And um, if we could switch to the closing slide that we have. Um, I, First of all, thank you, Tom, so much for giving this presentation. Would you be willing to look at the questions that we weren't able to get to and, um, and respond to those offline? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so everyone, we will um, have record of your questions, and we'll send them on to Tom. Uh, I wanted also to give you notice uh, that if you're interested in more uh, topics like these, on you know, talking about the future of EHS and just leading topics of interest when it comes to health and safety, to visit us at the 2018 Campbell Institute Symposium. This is going on next month, February 20th and 20th.
through the 21st in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, the registration is closing soon. We're asking that if you're interested, you book your hotel room before tomorrow. We have our uh, uh, prices there for Institute members and general attendees. And if you want more information, you can go to thecampbellinstitute.org slash symposium. And to view the, the recording of this webinar when it is available, it's still thecampbellinstitute.org slash webinars. And that's where you can find uh, the recording. Uh, you can also find my contact information uh, there on, on the same website as well if you're interested in contacting me or uh, about any of our research projects. Uh, so with that, thanks again, Tom. Um, we really appreciate your time and the knowledge and information that you shared with us. Um, and everybody, have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate your attention and participation in today's event. You may all disconnect.